Hi, everybody. How's it going? I can't see my kids, but they're here somewhere. I've been in ministry for 15 years, and I can't tell you the amount of times that I've met with someone just to talk. We chit chat and we smile for a bit, and then the person takes this, you know, this deep breath, and the conversation and the atmosphere kind of takes a shift into something different. I mean, just last week, someone came to me with this infamous ache of the human heart, and they said in this defeated voice, I just want to be happy. And the funny thing is, is that my students think that I have the answer to these things. Um, for example, the pandemic. I have scars and grief and trauma that I don't think will ever go away from those two years. So how? How do you live in this world with all the ways that it can break your heart and still be happy? Is a happy life even possible? Well, 15 plus years of conversations, student after student, mentor after mentor, I've been trying to sort out the problem of pain and the human pursuit of happiness. But I never really found a great response that I think captured it all. The explanations I would get always felt so incomplete Does anybody know what I'm talking about? People would say stuff like, well, the hard times, oh, sorry, well, without the hard times, we wouldn't know the good. Don't get me wrong, that makes sense. But I think it only works for some situations. And what about cancer? What about the despair of losing a loved one, someone way too good and someone way too young? So I became a bit obsessed The people that I work with, if you're watching, they know that I'm obsessed with human, studying human suffering. One of my theology mentors, Dr. Ed Hannenberg, he gave us this final assignment to write our own system of theology. And I titled mine, Theology of Suffering. I started with this foundational question. It went like this. What does it mean to be human? And goodness, there are so many things I don't know about this question. There are so many uncertainties, so many loose ends. But there is one thing I know, and it's this. To be human is to suffer. Sometimes people will push back and say, well, no, to be human is to love. And I think that's beautiful. But what if people never come to know love? And what if love leaves them? On some level, on some personal level, I think the only thing that I know is guaranteed in life is pain and suffering. It's our fate. Suffering is baked into the experience, and none of us make it out of this thing alive. <laughs> so what chance do we have in this life to be happy? How do you live in this world with all the ways it could break your heart, all the ways it could wreck you, and still be happy? So surprisingly, in my research, I found a lot of helpful stuff, a lot of depressing stuff, but helpful. Um, we could spend weeks in this room talking about the question, but I just want to share one thesis with you and a couple of rapid-fire things about joy. Will we solve everything? No but I think we can think about it a little bit differently and be reminded of what's important. So are you ready for the thesis? Ah, you can read along with me. Joy is different than happy. Happy generally exists in this either or relationship with sad. In contrast, joy has plenty of room for anger, loss, betrayal, heartache, depression, despair. Joy does no repressing. It does no avoiding, no denying. Joy can wrap its arms around the full spectrum of the human experience. 
I think that joy can handle it all. It's a fundamentally different way of understanding uh, life and all that it brings. When I heard this for the first time, personally, it was like I had some room to breathe again. It allowed me to have this like giant exhale because most of the stuff that I was hearing just didn't cut it. It explained aspects of some things, but it would fall apart if I just poked it a little bit. I started to realize, of course, of course happy is in this either or relationship with sad. And if I can only have one or the other, if I can have one or the other, then I don't want that. Life is more complex. It's not that simple. If it is either or, then no, I don't think a happy life is possible because sadness and pain and grief will find its way in one way or another. But joy, joy on the other hand, I think is bigger. It's wider, it's more flexible, it's bendy. It flows in and out and amongst our grief and despair. It can coexist with our pain. It can soothe and comfort our sorrow. Joy goes beyond the either or and moves into the both and realm, where more than one thing can be true at the same time. In this both and realm, I can experience deep agonizing grief and depression, which I have, which I do, which I will, but within it, I can still experience joy and peace and gratitude. So this gives me hope. And by the way, if you're getting tripped up on the word joy, then try to replace it with something that works for you. I know that some people can't get over thinking about joy being this like excited giddiness, but what I mean is more of like a a joy peace. And the point isn't even the word joy, but what I mean is it's, it's finding that thing that can coexist with our suffering. It's finding that thing that can hold everything that we bring to the table. So for me, it's joy. Is it gratitude? Is it peace? What is it for you? In my search through this question, I flew across the country to attend this workshop on joy, and I tried to get some clarity, even more clarity, and what I had was this opportunity to learn about this collection uh, of ancient Jewish wisdom poetry, specifically on the book called Ecclesiastes. I had no idea that this collection of poetry and wisdom was centered all on this question. How do we deal with suffering and happiness and grief and loss? So let's dive in. This is the first line of the book. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. This writer is talking about life. So it kind of like affirmed my thesis, right? Affirmed my thesis of like life is suffering. What can we do? The interesting thing about this that I learned at the workshop is that, let's see, I'm gonna fast forward a little bit. There is a word here that's repeated. Um, The word that we're talking about is meaningless. And the word meaningless in the Hebrew language is havel. And havel literally translates to the words vapor or mist. So it's like the writer was kind of trying to say some things about life. I hope that you can see this. Can you see this? Yes. Meaningless. <laughs> life is meaningless. It's like you're here and then you're gone. It's like you're here <laughs> and then it's gone. The fleetingness of life is what this book is about. And how do we move forward with this fleetingness? The poet in Ecclesiastes goes on. He says things like, you're just here for a moment. And yes, life can be full of suffering. But while you're here and while you have it, you should probably enjoy it. And when you find something meaningful, if you are so lucky, You should probably give your energy to that. You should probably stop waiting. And you should probably do that. 
because you're here and then you're gone. It's crazy. This type of imagery that the writer uses like, has never left me. I think about it all the time. What can I do with the days that I have? Um, Ecclesiastes wisdom is for everybody that knows that A plus B doesn't always equal C. And we know about conventional wisdom, right? It's A plus B equals C, right? Like, you eat organic food, you stay healthy, you exercise, and you live a happy, healthy whole life. Or you fall in love, you get married, you have kids, and you live happily ever after. But Ecclesiastes' wisdom is for the people that followed the rules but still got burnt. They followed the formula, and it still didn't work out. You took good care of your body, and you still got that, di- that diagnosis from the doctor. Or you were faithful and true, and then you found out that they loved somebody else and that they were going to live another life with them. In some ways, to understand Ecclesiastes' wisdom, you have to have gone enough, far enough down the road that maybe you've lost some people in your life that were too young to leave us. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And don't don't get me wrong, you need this. You need this for proper human development and growth. It's how we get to where we are. But Ecclesiastes wisdom, it's not meant to compete. It's not meant to compete with conventional wisdom. It's meant to inform. It's meant to inform for how you should live moving forward. It's kind of like a person will say, like, I've seen how fragile this whole thing is. I've seen it, I know it, I've wrestled with it. And because I've seen how wobbly it is, how uncertain it is, how there are no guarantees in life, I'm going to live this way, grateful as much as I can, living in joy, enjoying life as much as I can. When I went to Nicaragua on my first immersion trip, I was kind of shocked and kind of stunned and caught off guard by the joy that I experienced on this uh, learning trip um, from the Nicaraguan coffee farmers and families that I had met. I heard stories about war and oppression, paralyzing poverty, lack of water, lack of resources, illness, violence, and still I was like, we would hear these stories and we would go home and we, they would play some music and we would dance together in their, in their home, in their space. I'm like, what is this? Like, a lot of our students will come back with these experiences and say like, wow, like they were just so happy. <laughs> and that always felt like weird to me. Like, like, happy can't exist when like this family doesn't have water. They're not happy. To me, I had to take a step back and think about, you know, like, why was I shocked? And it was like, oh, it's because I was expecting this whole thing to be heavy. I was expecting it to be like, oh, let's, let's march for justice. Let's link arms and march, and let's, let's, let's just take a look and focus on the light at the end of the tunnel. But they had already made it through and experience, were experiencing joy. Uh, my Nicaraguan host family had seen how fragile life is. They had been all the way through it. And because of that, it had informed the way they lived their life. They were living out Ecclesiastic, Ecclesiastes' wisdom. So, how can we do it? How can we practice it? I think that everyone here has had a glimpse of joy. Just think back to maybe like a moment that you were with your friends or family around the dinner table. And you just had this moment where everything seemed right. And you had this moment out of time And you're like, this, this is what life is about. And maybe, maybe it was some time that you were going through something really dark. And it was just this random moment of like, outside of time, something bendy. Like it it was like physically one second, but it felt like 
in eternity, or it felt like three hours of you reliving like this whole thing, the beginning and the end, all of it at once, these bendy moments of joy. That's kind of what we're talking about, that it can, it can sneak in, even in the midst of your darkest moments. Um, joy, I think, is like a muscle. You can get better at it. You can work on spotting it. You can work on savoring it. And when you get it, um, St. Ignatius of Loyola, the founder of this university, says, don't you dare leave that moment. Stay in that moment as long as possible. Um, and more of those moments. Work that joy muscle so that you can have more of those moments in this crazy thing that we call life. Last thing, last couple things, is that joy, just remember that joy is light. It's not ashamed to be a beginner. Um, It's kind of like, I'm okay. I've made it through these dark times, I'm okay. I'm okay with falling on my face because I need more from this life. I'm not done yet. I need more from this vapor. Let's wrap this up. So for thousands of years, and for as long as we've been talking about what matters most as human beings, we've been talking about this question of joy. How? How do you live in this world with all the ways it can break your heart and have joy? And for thousands of years, those who have come before us have insisted that joy is real, joy is accessible, and joy is possible. The thing is, though, it never comes from the avoidance of how difficult and heartbreaking life is. It comes from embracing the fragility of life. You go all the way through the heavy, and you come into the lightness of it on the other side. And then you wake up, and you realize, oh my God, God, we're still here. I'm still here. So. What do you want to do? What is it that you're going to give your energy to? How will you contribute to the power of the good? Thank you.